it's uh, 734 in the evening in Ann Arbor. So I think we'll uh, start the program on behalf of the Rackham Graduate School and LSNA's Center for Japanese Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's or morning's event from Japan to Ann Arbor, which will be a panel discussion with four graduate students from Japan. We're really happy to have uh, you with us. I'm Michelle Siegel, I'm with uh, the Rackham Graduate School. And what we'll be starting with this evening is um, some remarks by Rackham Assistant Dean John Godfrey, who will talk a little bit about international students and the life of the university as well as providing some other important updates on how things are going. And then we'll have some greetings and remarks from Professor Yuki Shiraito, who will uh, talk about the Center for Japanese Studies. And then um, we'll hear from our fantastic students about their research and their experiences in Ann Arbor. And there'll be pr plenty of opportunity for you to join in by asking questions, either using the chat function or um, by raising your hand if you care to do that. We have a manageable number of, of people joining us, so you can feel free to unmute and ask a question or um, raise your hand or write something in the chat function. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Godfrey, who's the assistant an assistant dean at Rackham, and um, much of his work has focused on the needs and supporting international students at Rackham. John? Thank you very much, Michelle, and thanks to all of you. And on behalf of Rackham, I'm very pleased to welcome you, and thank you for joining us this morning and this evening. Uh, <clears throat> I want to start off uh, by reminding us all, by reminding myself <laughs> of the extraordinary uh, history of uh, students from Japan at the University of Michigan. <clears throat> Indeed, some of the very first international students to come to this university were from Japan, and they arrived in the 1870s. And to think about it, what a remarkable time in the history of Japan and the United States for that to have happened. These people included Masakazu Toyama, who went on to become the fourth president of the University of Tokyo and then Japan's first minister of education. He received an honorary master's degree, master of arts degree from this university back in 1886, which was the first ever granted to a Japanese citizen by any American university. <clears throat> and Ejiro Ono, another very well-known uh, uh, figure in uh, Japan, uh, came to Michigan in the late 1880s. And he went on to become the first pre the president of what was then the Industrial Bank of Japan and then later the Bank of Japan. Uh, he came here in 1887 and he did graduate study in economics. Uh, at the time, both of these individuals were here. Ann Arbor had a population of about 9,000 people. And the total university enrollment was about 2,000. So keep that in mind as I share with you uh, some information about our international graduate students today at the university. Uh, and could you advance the slide? I'm just going to give you a quick overview. To, 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 and, and I know even our graduate students and actually many faculty uh, don't have an opportunity to see this comprehensive view of, 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 of international students at the university. This year, these charts give a very simple overview of the distribution of all students in the uh, Rackham graduates and Rackham's graduate programs. Um, most of our students are in doctoral programs. We have a good and actually a growing number of students in uh, very dynamic master's programs. Uh, this shows the distributions by broad disciplinary area, the two charts on the right, a broad disciplinary area. Of, uh, of our students uh, in both the master's and the doctoral level. Can you, can you move it up, Ann? Um, this year about, again, this shows our distribution of, of students uh, by gender and uh, by domestic and international students. And I wanna direct your attention particularly to the right side of this page 
And so you can see that fully near over 40% of all master's students are international students. And nearly 40% of all of our doctoral students are international students. And this, these, these simple figures in a way underrepresent the importance of, 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 of what's going on here, is that our international students are absolutely essential to this university's position as a leading global university. I, university of Michigan would not be what it is today were it not for its international students uh, who have come here, to studied, done a very important research and contributed to the growth and the maturity of the university over many decades. Could you move it up one more? Um, there are more than 8,500 students today in all of Rackham's programs that are in every school and college, I should say, except for the law school. We do not have a program in the law school. Uh, and uh, our students come from more than 100 countries. The largest share of these students are from East Asia. Notably, the most, the leading, and this will not be a surprise to anybody here on campus in China, India, Korea, and Taiwan. In recent years, applications received from students in Japan have declined somewhat. Uh, back in the early 2000s, we received on average, oh, between 170 and 200 applications a year. And this has declined since 2016 uh, by a little bit more than a third. So now it's about up to 120 are received each year. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, attributable to many reasons, uh, including on, on, uh, the, I think the, the problems that students have experienced in recent years with visas and concerns about the welcoming atmosphere in the United States, but certainly not at this university. Anne, could you move it up? I just wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of the last couple of years and how the COVID crisis has really had a significant impact on our graduate students. Um, the applications for admission to graduate school fell uh, as a consequence of, um, of, of, of COVID uh, for international student applications, that is. Um, our, our applications, uh, the number of applications have increased generally year by year, but uh, COVID had a very significant impact on, uh, on international student first-time enrollment. Um, we have seen though, since 2020, in this past year, we have seen enrollment increase, uh, particularly with our, in our master's students. And our PhD enrollment has managed to retain, be, remain fairly stable uh, in large part because of how doctoral students are supported by the university because they contribute so importantly to research and teaching. Anne, could you go to the next slide? Uh, <clears throat> In fall 2020, um, uh, over a thousand international students were unable to get visas because American consulates around the world shut down and because uh, of air travel, international air travel was interrupted. And all of these students either deferred to come this, this fall or they had the option of beginning their studies from their home countries. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that this, this university took the lead nationally among all of its peers, peer universities to facilitate international student participation, even though they were not able to travel. Uh, the uh, arrangements have, were made to allow students simply to defer or to attend classes remotely uh, from their home countries when this is possible. And truly exceptionally, this includes doctoral students who were able to begin their studies last year and who were supported um, by fellowships or by appointments as graduate student instructors or research assistants. Uh, and they were able to, with that support, um, to join the university. And many of these students finally succeeded this summer in getting their visas and arriving on time for the start of the fall term. Um, I, I can only say that this has been an ex absolutely unprecedented 18 months in the entire history of the graduate school. 
uh, in order to accommodate international students and to fight for their interests as best we could. Um, and is, are we have anything else? Well, okay. So I, I'd like to turn this over to the students who are actually the center for, uh, for, for this evening's uh, uh, discussion and to thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, you, you all are absolutely exceptional and invaluable to uh, this university and its success and to the success of every student, no matter what nationality at this university, we're extremely proud to have you and to welcome you into this long tradition of Japanese scholars and scientists and researchers who have come to Michigan. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, um, so much for those comments and the background. I always learn so much from hearing you talk. Um, and now Professor Shira Ito is going to bring greetings on behalf of the Center for Japanese Studies at Michigan, and then he will be introducing our students. It looks like he has an internet connection issue. He just uh, logged off, but uh, I think that he will be coming back. He is. Uh, He's on campus right now, so he should be okay. Um, okay. Uh, I know he is going to share some information about the center, but maybe uh, what we oh, can. He's back. He's, he's back? back? Yes. Okay. Excuse Hello. Me. My Zoom froze. Uh, let me share my slides. Hopefully this time it works. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Can you all see the slide? Okay. Um, it, え、ミシガン州からこんばんは。え、日本の皆様おはようございます。あ、本日はえ、このイベントにご参加いただきまして、大変ありがとうございます。え、私はあ、日本ミシガン大学日本研究センターのあの、え、アソシエートディレクターを
So that's uh, that's a kind of a research side of the Center for Japanese Studies. It looks like he's having an internet issue again. Okay. Um, he's not able to join us in the next moment. Um, Yuri, maybe you can introduce the students. Shall I first, um, do I have, oh. He's gone and I think he is coming back. Could we wait for 30 seconds? Sure. Thank you. He's back. I'm sorry, I don't know what is going on. Actually. Uh, where did I froze? After the research part. Okay, so, uh, okay, so I didn't. Uh, let me just, let me just avoid using full screen mode. That should be fine. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's it for the research side of the Center for Japanese Studies. Uh, on the education side, we have uh, you know not necessarily though not necessarily all students are affiliated with the Center for Japanese Studies, but uh, but for you know, among the entire university, we have more than thousand students in more than hundred Japan related courses, which is uh, quite a large number, I believe. Uh, and in, you know, among those thousand students, about 400 students are taking Japanese language courses. Um, and, uh, you know, for the master's students, uh, we, the, we have actually the area studies master's program. And in the 2021 cohort, there were, there were 27 area studies master's students and actually five out of 27 are um, uh, in Japanese studies, which is actually the second largest group in, in that cohort. Um, so we regularly send uh, students to Japan. Uh, so in the academic year 2018 to 2019, uh, 20, uh, 224 students traveled to Japan. Uh, we funded 15 of those students and about 20 uh, students uh, experienced internship program in Japan. Um, of course, unfortunately, um, uh, ex except for um, you know faculty members and uh, and students who have Japanese nationalities, uh, because of the travel ban uh, imposed by Japan, almost no study or research trips to Japan by UM students and scholars have been uh, possible. Uh, uh, since spring 2020. Um, so I want to sort of beg your support. Uh, any form your, of your support matters. Um, financial support for uh, students' virtual study abroad program. Um, some language, uh, language program in Japan 
are providing a virtual uh, option to the students abroad. And uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, oftentimes the students have to uh, uh, have to sort of secure their um, their stipend or their uh, uh, their fellowship uh, in 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 the United States. Um, also, uh, the scholars are you know, scholars cannot travel to Japan in order to sort of field work, uh, archival research, and other, other kinds of uh, research activities in Japan. And therefore, um, you know, support for uh, research activities while being outside of Japan, such as purchasing materials and, and things like that, would be uh, very much appreciated. Um, even just expressing emotional support for our students uh, would be uh, very uh, helpful uh, because in some cases, um, you know, uh, in, in the time of the pandemic, international students are easily targeted by uh, xenophobic comments and attacks and therefore just emotional support would be, uh, would be very much uh, would be very much appreciated. Um, so thank you very much. That's it uh, on about uh, the Center for Japanese, Stu uh, Japanese Studies. And let me turn to introducing uh, today's students, uh, student speakers. So let me, um, let me reverse alphabetical order of their, uh, of their last name. Uh, so Mizuho, please, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, so we have, we have four students. Um, Mizuho Takayama, a master's student in aerospace and engineering. Uh, Kana Otani, master's student in public policy school. Uh, Tsuyoshi Kano, uh, a PhD student in information, uh, in, in the School of Information. And Shugo Kaneko, a PhD student uh, in aerospace engineering and scientific computing. Um, so I ask uh, students uh, to speak in that order. So uh, please, Mizuho, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I actually have a bad internet connection, it seems. So I try to connect the ethernet right now, but if you find some cutting off, can you like remind me so that I can repeat it up? Thank you very much. So I was actually expecting the last person to speak. So my contents would be kind of like more unique, my unique experience, but I hope you guys enjoy my stories. So good morning in Japan, ohayou gozaimasu, and good evening in the US. My name is Mizuho Takayama, majoring in aerospace engineering. So when I first come to the US, I was 19 years old and things are changed every year, especially this year by due to our topic of pandemic. So one change was the Japanese education for the non-Japanese student. I've been teaching Japanese for six years and three years are in the University of Michigan. What I feel was my office hour environment, like atmosphere changed between before and after pandemic. Last year, I thought the student who had in-person class first year and online course for the second year, I mean this year, they ask me, they ask in the office server about like how I feel like the difference the practical changes for like subject ga or subject ha for the same sentences or how to write the kanji more neatly. I felt they are interested in speaking in Japan, study abroad and enjoy communicating and express, expressing themselves in Japanese. So my office hours are like joining three people together and discussing their Japanese. This year, we are teaching the students who have trained all online 
from last year to this year. They they study well like other years, but I felt there was a slightly insight of change. I observed their insight into especially grammar and pronunciation. One student asked me why does my flexion of the sentence for this and mas and some specific words differ from my instructor, which is correct. And I'm so surprised that I didn't notice the difference when I talk with the instructor. The student instructor from the west side, I mean Kansai region, and I'm from the east side, I'm from the Kanto region. And he noticed that the difference of my like a, a slight pronunciation without the study of dialect study or any no not study our experience. I have never asked that before with specific words for pronunciation differences, especially if student only studied Japanese for two years, just only two years. This reminded me that student online, students in online environment are closer, closer to their instructor and they carefully take care of the lectures for each lectures. And there is more space to focus on reading, pronunciation and grammar. The student also looks really free to get to set their goals. That's all I observed in my Japanese teaching. Oh, I also, also have our exciting things for Japanese study, especially for Japanese language. Like we usually have around 100 students for each, each, each level, first year Japanese and second year Japanese. But only for this year, we got the 200 students, which is twice as much as usual for the first year, first year Japanese. It amazed to me a lot and grateful that we have many students interested in Japanese. And I'm, I'm hoping like more students come to my, like my, not my class, but University of Michigan, Michigan's Japanese class. So let me talk about that now about my study at University of Michigan. The other pandemic change is the research environment. My major is aerospace engineering and thankfully, and because of many of you guys of the helps, I had two research opportunities right now in the university and at the Toyota Research Institute. Um, by the way, I didn't know like there is a visiting Toyota professor like you, Professor Yuki-san said. So yeah, for my research topic now, I am conducting the experiment of fluid simulation to investigate how to solve fluid equations more accurately. We are considering that we don't have a enough accurate and enough efficient solution, if in enough efficient solver to solve the fluid. So I am investing how we can improve the accuracy of the solution using a new solver and algorithm that I am doing for my fluid research. And I also research structure simulations. For example, I simulated the Japanese style origami or apply or Miura Ori design, which is a Japanese, like Japanese people try to for the like a uh, big strength, like strong with a uh, like much higher strength than usual origami. And this simulation exciting is real quite exciting to me because what I folded when I was childhood applied to a new engineering design. In addition, my simulation reveals that the origami of a balloon or basket increased their ability for emerging engineering design for the energy absorbance purposes. So I'm excited that the some art can be a next, air, next generation of aircraft or vehicle design. So my future research goal is to improve the accuracy of simulation to contribute to safety engineering. So, 
this semester, I'm doing graduate student instructor for Japanese and doing those two research and I'm taking the class. For me, that's quite busy schedule for usual. But thanks to the improvement of the remote environment, I can have a more chance to work and study. I feel I have 30 hours every day instead of 24 hours because I can use time efficiently since I don't have to go to travel to the classroom every day. So last things I want to mention about the pandemic was like this year, the big things happened to me. Like I lost my little sister due to disease and she was only 23 years old. And that makes me consider what if I am diagnosed with a severe illness or what if I catch COVID today or even now? I'm kind of really scared about that. And that thought clarified my understanding of how to live without any regrets or any sorrow with keeping safety. And I believe that the task applied to the pandemic situation for everyone in the world. So this speech concludes that a pandemic may decrease my outside activities, but still I got more time and it gave me more challenges and opportunities than ever at the University of Michigan. Again, I also state in my mind that thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to let me stand here. And thank you for this fantastic opportunity to share my story. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for sharing the story. Um, Okay, well, next uh, next panelist is Kana Otani. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for inviting me today and I'm super honored to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Kana Otani. I am a second year of Master of Public Policy student at Florida School. So I don't have a specific like story like me so far, so I'm gonna just talk about my background, tell you why I came here or like what I'm studying. I got bachelor degree of political science in Japan, and I started to work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan before I came here. So this um, program is actually one of the language learning program provided by ministry. And actually, this is the second time to live in Michigan. Like five years ago, I was in Northern Michigan University for a year as a sister scholarship student. So I knew for the school how to top long public policy program. And I already have some friends in Michigan. That's why I'm here right now. That's why I chose University of Michigan. Um, I, um, uniquely MPP program doesn't require a student to submit any thesis or uh, do some research projects. So I don't have any specific topic of my research, but MPP student can choose policy concentration from five different choice, like analytical method, non-profit management, social policy, international policy, or so on. So currently I'm seeking international policy and international economic development concentration because I'm interested in international aid and public diplomacy. Um, so that's why I'm taking those classes um, from photo school and from um, CIS. Um, it's, I'm not sure, the School of uh, Environment and Sustainability, I guess. Yeah. And I came to an hour last year, so it was totally under the COVID situation, so everything held by online, so I couldn't attend any in-person class, but still I could see my friends sometimes. So it was a great opportunity. And mostly I was taking the um, class from photo school and the land analytical skill, which is super important for successful, successful policy analysis and the public policy institution and the process. But 
this semester I'm taking classes from outside for the school mostly. Um, as I said earlier, I'm taking the class from CIS and also uh, Department of Asian Language Cultures. And also I'm, one, I'm taking one from business school. Especially I'm enjoying taking the critical introduction to Asian cities. I had no background knowledge about anthropologies or genealogies. So it was quite new and I was super struggling with reading those assignments or like participating in discussion. But now I'm super enjoying to talk with other stud students who have different background, academic background from me. And currently I try to write the paper about the feminist orientalism and orientalist feminism in Afghanistan by using the US media or like the White House um, way of reporting Afghanistan station. Like this um, Afghanistan station is super severe, but like US tried to use women as a tool to justify their intervention or something like that. So it was quite interesting by connecting current situation and also the concept from the history. So I'm super enjoying that class and I'm glad for the school allowed me to take outside for the school class. And I feel like this flexibility is a super attractive point of University of Michigan. So I'm super glad to be here. Yeah, that's the all my story. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Well, next panelist uh, is Tsuyoshi Kano. Please go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tsuyoshi Kano. I'm very honored to be here. So I briefly explain my research and my life in Anabar because I just guess some of you may be alumni of here. In Michigan. So I'm a doctoral student in School of Information. And uh, many people don't know what School of Information is doing. So if I just say very, very simply, we research how technology change our lives. So and my research is about information technology for international development. So in other words, uh, how we can use technology to like end poverty or to contribute to economic development. And uh, especially my study focus on it's a kind of social science research on IT <clears throat> human resource development and IT industry development, especially in Bangladesh and Rwanda, that's my research field. For example, I had a research on what kind of bottleneck exists in Rwanda ICT sector, IT sector, and what kind of human resource I'm missing and why such kind of research I am doing. And uh, my main motivation to come here in Michigan was uh, one is uh, my practical experience uh, in JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. And I was in Bangladesh and I was uh, in charge of Rwanda. So I got, had some, got some kind of interest. And uh, another one is a uh, uh, my advisor. Uh, my advisor was a kind of leading researcher in my field, so that's why I chose here. And uh, But in recent years, uh, actually COVID affected my research a lot. Uh, I conducted a field experiment in Bangladesh, but uh, I plan to go there to monitor, but uh, the project was suspended due to pandemic. And uh, I finally had to give up part of my uh, research project. But fortunately, uh, that was good enough to write my dissertation. I could collect enough to write my dissertation so I could uh, yeah, write my dissertation, but uh, I'm not sure when I want to publish it, it's enough or not. And finally, uh, regarding my life, uh, I like Ann Arbor a lot, and I live in Nosut 4, uh, University Housing. I guess some of you may have visited 
Northwood actually very beautiful place. And I think Northwood didn't change since you were there. Uh, there are still many old wood houses, uh, beautiful and wide grounds with square and deers. Yeah, so that's Northwood and Michigan. So yeah, thank you again for inviting me. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so our final speaker is Shugo Kaneko. Sure, thank you, Professor, for introducing me. So hello, everyone. My name is Shugo Kaneko, and I am a third year PhD student in aerospace engineering, the same department as Mizuho. And I am researching the computational simulation and design of aircraft. So I'm trying to establish how to let the computers find the best design automatically using the applied mathematics, physics, models, and simulations. So right now, specifically, my research application is on the systems design of drones for package delivery, like what Amazon Prime Air is trying to do. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the research today because otherwise I'm, I was gonna keep talking like forever, but aerospace is what I do and I am very happy about it. So I started my PhD program in fall of 2019, half a year before the pandemic. So it, I think it was fortunate for me to have at least half a year to, to let's say the build a face-to-face -face connection with my advisor and my fellow student in the lab. I think that face-to-face -face, the connection made my remote work much easier and comfortable. And since this summer, I'm, I'm finally back in my office in the North Campus. And actually, I don't have to be on campus to do my research because my topic is all about the simulations and theories. But I think I still appreciate the random in-person discussions I sometimes have with my, my with other students or postdocs in the lab, which was pretty hard to do when everything was online. And before starting here as a year PhD student, I did my undergrad in Japan, Fukuoka, but I actually spent my junior year as an exchange student here at U of M in Ann Arbor. So this is my second time studying here. And when I first came here as a year exchange student, I knew nothing about Anaba, nothing about Michigan, and I had been using all of my time and energy to just take it, take classes, do homework, and you know adjust to the new culture and survive. So to be honest, I had nothing fun outside of the classroom when I did my undergrad exchange here. But now as a uh, Rackham student, and recently, I have some time and energy left for the weekends to not to do the research or homework, but actually do explore the city and uh, Michigan. So I drove to the west, also to the north to enjoy some hiking, as well as to spend some time on the beach, which was pretty nice. So my research topic is challenging, but very interesting to me. And I am spending good time out, outside of the campus as well. So overall, I'm very happy to have, a, have an opportunity to study at, in Michigan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, okay, we can have, uh, we have some time for Q and A. Um, if, if any of the, anyone in the audience has any questions, please submit to a chat or you can use a raise hand uh, function uh, to ask questions. While, while we are waiting for uh, the question from the audience, let me ask one question for the students. Um, so this is actually, you know, uh, this is actually a question I was asked when I was a grad student. Um, so when you first came to the United States, what surprised you the most? Any, anyone can start. I'll start. 
So nice. I would say everything was big, like people, cars, houses, and now kind of get used to it. And I feel everything is small back in Japan. But yeah, first time I was surprised how huge the buses and the trucks are at the airport. Nice, interesting. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I, yeah, okay. I, I kind of agree with you because uh, every time I go back to Japan, I'm surprised by how small the, the portion in restaurants is. So it's a, uh, it's quite an interesting answer. Anyone else? Okay, so let me go. Uh, in my, my case is a little bit different with others. So uh, before coming to Ann Arbor, I was in Bangladesh, Dhaka. So that is one of the most congested uh, place of the world. So anywhere, many people and a little bit, not a little bit, very bad air pollution and the bad water, such kind of environment I was. So after coming here, I really liked the environment in Ann Arbor. So with green, blue sky, and uh, not so many people. So yeah, I felt like, oh, it's like a haven. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that was my yeah, memory. Thank you, interesting, uh, very interesting. Uh, Kana Mizuho, do you have any, anything to say? I'm sorry, your question is about the like difference between Japan and US? Well, yeah, I mean, you can talk about that in the-, oh, in the I, I'm sorry, would you but, please repeat, repeat the question? Oh, what, what, what surprised, like when you first came to the United States, what surprised you the most? Okay, not the first, but recently my, I live in the kind of like, uh, I'm not living in Ann Arbor, I live in Ypsilanti area, and I hear some gun shooting once a week. So that's my surprising recently. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's, uh, that's quite interesting experience. Kana, do you have any? Yeah, like I tried to come up with something, but like I just come up the number of Christmas party you guys have. Like in Japan, we have just only one with family or plan on like a 24th or something. But when I stay with my host family, they have like a bunch of like around 10, like with coworkers, with these friends, the, you know, the husband's coworkers. So like we, I went the Christmas party like over five times and it, stay like it lasts until 28th or something so that is a quite surprising stuff for me interesting uh, so there is a question in the chat yep uh okay. yep i'm seeing it um okay yeah so while we were talking about the first question uh uh we got a question in the chat function uh, from miho uh takahashi uh, so could you share your hard experience about English or anything else? Anyone can go first. Okay, so I can go. <laughs> uh, I had a very many hard experience, especially in English. So it was my first time to study abroad and uh, uh, the first mandatory class for PhD students in School of Information was a kind of a weekly three hours discussion class. And uh, in the three hours only we have discussion about some papers. And uh, we are graded every week about how did you participate in the discussion. So every week I got three to one. And uh, uh, at the beginning, I was always low grade and I was so frustrated and uh, yeah, so I made a kind of talk with non-native uh, foreign students uh, with, I remember Chinese and the Taiwanese and we uh, studied together every week uh, to overcome the situation. Yeah, so I remember it was super, super hard, but good memory now. 
well, um, you know, overcoming hardness is always a good experience after <laughs> after <laughs> yeah. I think. But uh, I, I don't want to experience that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, anyone else? I have some related experience about discussion stuff, especially on Zoom class, it's super hard to engage as like a discussion point. And um, like I had experience about like talking with my friends after the class and he said, why don't you say anything? You have a, such a great comment on the discussion. But like I was not confident enough to say something because I am not sure um, I can catch what they said in the class so i was super hesitate if like if i made some comments super out of topic it's super embarrassing stuff so i don't want to say that that kind of feeling occupy my you know mind and it was super hard but like after this like a two semester or something i feel like if i say something wrong professor can do that like can do like collect my stuff or like they can enhance my topic so I just like give a shot and <laughs> that's the story yeah well um you know from from the side of of the of someone who's who who has, who has taught like remote classes you know it's it's most embarrassing you know like that no students speak up it's just like you know, silence on Zoom, like in a class, it's just very, very awkward. And so, you know, all instructors would appreciate, you know, if you if you speak up, like if you speak anything, I think. <laughs> so you should you should uh, you shouldn't be hesitant to do that. Mizuho, do you have a comment? Yes, I also had uh, like difficulty for English, like. Of course, pronunciation, like flow of speaking is really difficult. And also writing is also difficult. But I think most difficult part was uh, explaining the our implication. It's really hard, I think. I mean, like we can express our opinion, but in the same sentence, it's hard to express my mind. So like, if I speak Japanese, I can like, imply my feeling in the same sentence with opinion but for english it's really hard it's i should say i have this opinion because i have this mind or something like that so that's my heart for english i think thanks uh shugo do you have anything uh not, not specifically i mean of course i had but i don't remember anything i didn't like but so but <laughs> i now think like so as what i'm doing is pretty much the physics and the engineering so first i have never had any type of group student group discussion in class and also in the worst case scenario uh, we we could just use the equations numbers and the programming languages to discuss no english i mean I don't do that, but I could do that because of the, you know, the discipline that I study. So I think my life has been easier than other international students because of that. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, we are about time, but I we have one last question from Shoma Matsui. Um, do you have any advice for students in Japan who want to come to the US or to study abroad? Okay, so one point. This is not about Michigan or US, but the more general going to study to abroad. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, uh, Shoma, you are a student or like you're working, but uh, in my experience, when I worked, I didn't have time to improve myself. That's what, one of the biggest frustration of me. But uh, after going to study abroad, it was super busy but you can use 24 hours for only about yourself that's priceless and a very yeah precious thing so please come yeah thank you anyone else yeah i guess like 
most of the student who want to come but not is like they are worried about their language skill or like they're worried about if they can catch up the class but I don't think English is not an obstacle to study abroad just like if you want it and if you try to convey your opinion or just like uh, you if you show you're trying maybe they gonna try to understand and they gonna help you so don't worry your English skill just like come and practice in the daily life that's gonna be your great experience in your life thanks okay I'm gonna go I'm gonna talk about no academic side so first pack many Jap nice Japanese food and you know anything you like you don't need any textbook just use a pdf for textbook but bring the food you can get once but it's kind of expensive right here and the second after you arrive at the us get a driver's license and buy a car as soon as possible it's pretty hard to live without a car i mean depending on the city but at least in michigan it's hard and i know a lot of japanese students decide to chose to not buying car, but I, I will personally recommend it. I think that's actually a very good point. Uh, I totally agree. Okay, Mizuho, go ahead. I agree with the Japanese food. We should bring a lot. <laughs> and maybe for undergrad or like master's student with like limited budget, I feel like study enough in Japan and come to the US because when you when we come to the US I'm I especially maybe only me but I feel like occupied with the cultural difference environment or something so prepare enough in Japan and come to the US was is one strategy to like one advice who want to come to study abroad from my side Okay, great. Thank you very much all. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, running out of time. So at the end of the event, uh, I think Suzy, Suzy is going to make a closing remarks. Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much to each of you uh, for sharing your stories and your insights and your perspectives. It's really impressive and wonderful to hear how you've navigated learning cross-culturally, uh, living and, and working and teaching and studying and doing research in completely different culture and environment. And we're so privileged to have you here with us on campus. It's a real honor to have you and to have you be part of the U of M community. I will say I work closely with the Center for Japanese Studies, including, including Yuri Fukuzawa and uh, the director of the Center for Japanese Studies. And, you know, Michigan is a big place. There are 17,000 graduate students and it's easy to get lost in a big place. And the Center for Japanese Studies is really a place that can kind of be a home away from home and make a big university feel smaller. So um, I hope that will continue to be the case going forward. And for any students that haven't intersected closely with the center, um, hopefully they will in the future. And also it's a place that creates a home away from home uh, for Michigan alumni and for Wolverines in Tokyo, in Japan. We regularly, pre-COVID, had events with over 100 alumni um, with many um, luminaries and uh, prominent people addressing the alumni community. And I hope when all of you graduate and become part of that alumni community, you will join us and continue to share your insights and experience with us and that we will all meet in person and we won't have to do these over Zoom <laughs> in the near future. So thank you again so much for your time and for your generosity and sharing your experiences with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day or good evening. Thank you very much.